let's move on to a practical analysis about choosing Medicare Advantage uh, as an option for Medicare coverage for this population. Now, we assume in, in providing these webinars a basic knowledge of Medicare Advantage plans, but just briefly, we, we all know that Medicare Advantage plans combine Part A and B services and sometimes Part D prescription drug coverage uh, through Medicare Advantage prescription drug plans in a lot of ways, as we'll talk about later, is really a one-stop shop. You can get uh, a lot of the Medicare services you need through a Medicare Advantage plan. Medicare Advantage plans have essentially the same coverage rules as traditional Medicare, but they do have some flexibility to impose different cost sharing, except for a certain number of services that we'll talk about in a minute, as long as the cost sharing is more or less actuarially equivalent to traditional Medicare. We also know that most types of Medicare Advantage plans are uh, managed care models that restrict enrollees to contracted networks of providers. Now, the Medicare Advantage world is not monolithic. There are different options of plans and different permutations, many, too many to really cover for the purposes of this webinar this afternoon. But very briefly, the types of, of Medicare Advantage plans we are all familiar with, HMOs, of course, is the most prominent one with the most people in them. There are preferred provider organizations, PPOs, both local and regional, and, and to a much lesser extent than there were uh, several years ago private fee-for-service plans. There are also, however, special needs plans that ostensibly are geared towards special populations. We know that uh, as of last count, there were about 1.6 million individuals in dual eligible SNPs, also known as D-SNPs. Uh, there are also institutional SNPs and SNPs for individuals with certain specified chronic conditions. There are fewer folks in those types of special needs plans. We know that special needs plans have some additional requirements beyond what Medicare Advantage plans uh, are required to do, such as uh, many of them have, are required to have contracts with state Medicaid agencies for the provision of Medicaid services. And then we know also that as a result of the Affordable Care Act, there are demonstration plans, dual eligible demonstration plans that seek to integrate both Medicare and Medicaid financing and coverage into one managed care entity. As of March of this year, there were about 450,000 dual eligibles in a dual eligible demonstration plan in 12 different demos. But of course, folks can also be in separate Medicaid managed care organizations. We know that there's a growing trend towards providing long-term services and supports in the Medicaid arena through uh, managed care plans, many of which are not well integrated with Medicare Advantage plans. So again, there are many options and permutations when it comes to Medicare Advantage coverage. But what we want to do for the balance of this webinar is step back and take more of a broader uh, approach to looking at weighing Medicare Advantage coverage in general. Now, as SHIP counselors or SMP counselors, uh, we know that many of you are, are generally familiar with the pros and cons surrounding Medicare Advantage enrollment. We also know that uh, SHIPs and SMPs and, and many other counselors cannot steer people either towards Medicare Advantage plans or away from Medicare Advantage plans. What we did is we developed a roadmap of sorts, really a series of questions or issues to consider when exploring the Medicare Advantage option. This roadmap is not comprehensive. It's not a formula that will produce a right or wrong answer but hopefully will be something to help guide the discussion with individuals and help folks walk, walk through the thought processes behind whether or not to choose Medicare Advantage plans. After we walk through kind of these, these 10 questions or issues we put together in a roadmap of sorts, we're then going to touch on some other considerations surrounding the choice between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage planning. So starting with this roadmap, the first threshold question really for any Medicare beneficiary before uh, one should even start trying to decide whether or not they want to be in a Medicare Advantage plan or seek care elsewhere is what kind of coverage do you already have, if any, 
and are you eligible for any assistance with premiums or cost sharing? Sometimes your choice might already may, be made for you. Um, if folks are uh, qualified for Medicare savings program, that can go a long way towards covering some of their premium and out-of-pocket costs. We know that qualified Medicare beneficiaries, QMBs, have general protections against being balanced billed, and that is supposed to also apply in Medicare Advantage plans. The Part D low income subsidy is, is a great help to folks who are qualified for it. When it gets to other types of coverage, some individuals have employer coverage that is their primary coverage through either their own or a family member's current active employment. When someone has employer coverage that's primary, that'll generally preclude Medicare Advantage enrollment. Others have retiree coverage through former employers uh, that for Medicare beneficiaries is only offered through a plan, a Medicare Advantage plan that an employer contracts with. So for those folks who have that option and who want to get some type of retiree benefit uh, from their former employer, a lot of ways their choice is already made for them. If they want that benefit, they have to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. As Kathy noted earlier, Medigap availability varies significantly for folks under 65 because Federal law does not require Medigap plans to sell to folks under 65. Some states have added that extra right um, to their state requirements. The second question or, or issue or consideration, what providers or facilities do you as a Medicare beneficiary go to? Can I continue to see my doctor or doctors? For some people, this is the fundamental question. Relationships are built with the provider or providers that people do not want to, to uh, disengage from. For other folks, uh, it doesn't matter as much. How important is it to you to continue to seeing the current providers that you do see? Do they accept Medicare? And then do they accept Medicare Advantage plans? Are they participating in any Medicare Advantage plan networks? Sometimes issues arise when someone is in a Medicare Advantage plan and they, for example, want to use a provider or facility that does not contract with the Medicare Advantage plan. For example, sometimes uh, skilled nursing facilities that are outside of that network. So what providers you want to see, whether or not you want to continue to see them, and whether or not your providers that you want to see contract with some or many uh, or any uh, Medicare Advantage plans are some basic threshold questions. Third, these are considerations that uh, should be weighed whether or not an individual is seeking prescription drug coverage through a Medicare Advantage prescription drug plan, an MAPD, or a standalone Part D prescription drug plan. What medications do you take? What does the plan's formulary look like and does it cover the medications that you need? Can you take generics? What type of utilization management tools apply to the drugs that I need, such as prior authorization, quantity limits, step therapy, et cetera? What cost-sharing tier is my drug placed in? Is it in a higher cost-sharing tier? What type of pharmacy network does my plan have? Is it broad enough to allow me to, to see my local pharmacy, or am I going to have to pay more if I go to the pharmacy that I like? One of the main selling points of managed care is that, in theory, an individual's care is coordinated. In other words, someone or some entity is responsible for overseeing and directing your care and ensuring you get what you need. Not to say that some care is not coordinated or cannot be coordinated in traditional Medicare, but one of the hallmarks of managed care is that there is active care coordination. There's the teams of folks that are supposed to be ensuring you get the care that you need. How do you want to get your care? How much of that decision-making process do you want to uh, be a part of? Do you want your care choices directed for you, or do you want more autonomy? In a managed care setting, usually an individual has to go through a primary care physician as a gatekeeper for services. Often, if you want to see a specialist, you need to first get a referral from a primary care physician. Some services you need to get prior authorization for before you are authorized to get it from a plan. What is your preference? What are you used to? What do you value? Uh, 
when it comes to coordination, direction, and autonomy. Another question, uh, how often do you go outside of your plan's service area? Do you travel a lot? How often? How do you feel about having access limited to emergency or urgent coverage if you're outside of your general home area, which is the way that um, HMOs, for example, restrict care? If this is an issue for you and if you're considering a Medicare Advantage plan, maybe you might want to consider a Medicare Advantage plan that has more flexibility, um, such as you know, a, a regional a PPO that allows you to see folks out of network, or perhaps traditional Medicare would be a better option for someone in this situation. Issuer question six. Traditional Medicare by itself, meaning without a Medigap or other type of supplemental coverage, has no out-of-pocket limit for Part A and B services. You can uh, pay 20% in Part B expenses uh, for as long as you are charged those services. There is no out-of-pocket limit. And one significant benefit that is available through Medicare Advantage is that they do, uh, are they are required to tap an individual's out-of-pocket expenses on a yearly basis, the so-called MOOP, uh, maximum out-of-pocket. Costs. Plans uh, have to tap out-of-pocket expenses at at least $6,700. Um, in 2016, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, the average enrollee had a limit of $5,223 in out-of-pocket caps that Medicare Advantage plans uh, are set. So a uh, question, how important is, is it to you to have such a cap, such a protection against out-of-pocket expenses? Do you want to get that cap through Medicare Advantage? Or do you, if you want to be a traditional Medicare, do you have access to such a cap or the equivalent of a cap through like a Medigap plan or other type of supplemental? Issue or question seven, what value do uh, you place in other possible services that might be available through the Medicare Advantage plan that are not provided through traditional Medicare? Uh, based upon the, the way that a Medicare Advantage plan submits its plan bid and, and where its bid comes in relative to a, a benchmark rate for a given area, Medicare Advantage plans have to turn over certain of the extra money that they get in the form of extra benefits for Medicare beneficiaries that are not available to traditional Medicare. Most often that takes the form of some limited dental or hearing or vision care. Sometimes it's uh, uh, health club memberships, sometimes it's a reduction in the Part B premium. How important are those things to you? Uh, what are you able to get from a plan in your area? Threshold question or issue number eight. How do you weigh the convenience of one-stop shopping versus the need to really uh, check your benefits on an annual basis? Another big selling point of Medicare Advantage is that in many ways it allows an individual to obtain their Part D coverage and the equivalent of a supplemental plan through an entity, the Medicare Advantage plan. So in essence, it becomes one-stop shopping. However, we all know that those plans can and do change their benefit packages, the services that they, they cover, the cost sharing that they charge for those services, the providers with whom they contract on a yearly basis. So folks, would be really well served to continually check uh, if they're in a Medicare Advantage plan how their benefits might be changing from year to year and whether or not their providers are going to remain with that plan. Whereas if someone's in traditional Medicare and they choose a Part D plan, they will still have to do that for their Part D covered services, but with a Medigap, you don't have the same type of dynamic. Special question or issue nine. How part of Managing care includes, at times, denying care, even if you have, say, your doctor on board with your treatment plan. Now, from where we sit, we, we don't usually hear from individuals who are calling to talk about how well their care is coordinated. Rather, it's the folks who are having problems getting coverage or services coordinated or approved through their plan that call us. So not to say that care is not denied in traditional Medicare, because it most certainly is by Medicare contractors that process claims, but usually those denials happen on the back end after the care is agreed to or provided. In a Medicare Advantage plan, on the one hand, 
uh, can impose barriers to accessing care. On the other hand, though, in some ways, beneficiary and advocates have more leverage over Medicare Advantage plans with respect to accessing providers that someone in traditional Medicare uh, has. And, and by way of explanation, someone in traditional Medicare, as we'll talk about in a moment, can really go to any provider they want as long as that provider is willing to see them. We also hear from folks who are, have traditional Medicare and have considerable problems trying to find providers who are willing to treat them. For example, a home health agency. An individual has an order for home health care, but they cannot find a home health agency that is willing to treat them. If someone is in a Medicare Advantage plan and they require medically necessary services from a provider, there is more leverage to hold over that Medicare Advantage plan to provide those services. The Medicare Advantage plan, by virtue of having uh, the enrollees, if it agrees that such services are medically necessary, has an obligation to try to provide those services and connect individuals with providers who can do so. And finally, issue or question 10, will you be more likely to seek out care for yourself if it's convenient to you? If, if you can go see whatever provider you want, you're not restricted to a narrow network or to certain providers in certain locations? Will you be more likely to seek out care if it's at lower cost to you? If you uh, have traditional Medicare and you don't have any supplement, you're looking at 20% for Part B expenses, is cost sharing less in your Medicare Advantage plan? Is access to care easier for you in general? These are some, again, issues or questions that we pose in sort of a roadmap form a way to help organize questions or thoughts in assisting someone with trying to make a decision as to whether or not they want to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. We're now going to turn to other related considerations or factors to weigh uh, as to whether or not one uh, option or the other might be preferable for an individual. First, taking a look at traditional Medicare. One of the hallmarks of traditional Medicare is uh, the free choice of provider. That means you can see, if you have traditional Medicare, you can see whatever provider you want across the country. Your choice of provider is not limited with the significant caveat, though, that I just mentioned, that sometimes with traditional Medicare, you cannot find a provider that is willing to treat you. Another consideration when it comes to traditional Medicare is do you have any coverage that will fill in some of the gaps in Medicare coverage. Do you have any coverage or you have access to coverage that will supplement your Medicare? Uh, you, a lot of times people will look to Medigaps. And as Kathy noted earlier, uh, the federal law does not require Medigap issuers to issue plans to folks under 65. States have the right to add that uh, consumer protection into their own individual state laws. In 31 states have gone beyond the federal standards to require insurers to provide at least one kind of Medigap policy to folks under 65, but 19 states and the District of Columbia have not. If you are under 65 and you're in a state that does require an issuer to sell uh, at least one plan to you, what are the premiums going to look like? Are they prohibitively uh, high? Do you have other options for cost sharing? And many people, unfortunately, under 65 simply do not. Turning to other considerations for Medicare Advantage plans. If you have a Medicare Advantage plan, how will it coordinate with other insurance? Medigaps do not, by rule, coordinate with Medicare Advantage plans. And when it comes to other types of coverage that someone might have, whether it's an individual insurance policy, an employer insurance policy, a marketplace, plan through the exchanges, a qualified health plan, Medicaid, uh, despite some efforts at integrating Medicare and Medicaid, often coordination with other types of coverage can become complicated with a Medicare Advantage plan. And an individual who has Medicare Advantage in some other coverage might end up have to pay some or all of their Medicare Advantage uh, costs out of pocket, despite the fact that they might have some other type of coverage. Then there's the issue of whether or not an individual actively chooses Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, there has, over the last year or so, there has been an issue that's arisen um, known as seamless conversion enrollment, 
which has been a rule that has been on the books for a long time, but has only seemed to really service in the consciousness of, of advocates and counselors uh, relatively recently. If an individual is in a plan, a insurance plan, before they have Medicare, and the insurance company that offers their current plan also offers a Medicare Advantage product, that insurance company can petition the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to allow the company to seamlessly convert individuals into a Medicare Advantage plan upon Medicare eligibility. In other words, with permission from the Medicare program, the insurance company can move their pre-Medicare population in one insurance product they offer into their Medicare Advantage product while providing uh, those individuals the right to opt out of that option. But if the individual does nothing, they will be defaulted into Medicare Advantage. Now, the requirements are currently so minimal uh, that are placed on plans that it's very possible that individuals uh, will not be notified and will have no idea that it is happening. Right now, the requirements on plans uh, are that they send one written notice to an individual. Now, that notice might not be received, it might not be opened. If it is open, it might not be understood. If it is understood and the person is able to exercise their right to opt out, then um, you know, that person uh, might avoid being enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan without their consent. Now, it might be the best option for this person to stick with the same carrier and end up in the Medicare Advantage plan offered by that carrier, but we certainly argue that the way that this is the seamless conversion enrollment uh, system is set up now uh, really minimizes the chance for informed consent. This policy, by the way, is applicable both to folks who are aging into Medicare and people under 65. The insurance carriers cannot uh, discriminate amongst their current population based upon age. They have to essentially say, we're going to apply this process to everyone becoming eligible for Medicare within a certain time. Uh, stepping off of my um, soapbox for a moment, that's an issue we have seen lately and, and uh, about which we are very concerned, just as a, a heads up to folks to be aware of it. Also, uh, the issue of network adequacy. Most Medicare Advantage plans limit the network of providers, contracted to providers, who their enrollees are able to see. And it's quite possible that some plan networks might not always have adequate specialists or other providers to serve patient needs. There's a general, general accounting uh, organization, GAO report issued last year that highlighted the flaws in the current oversight by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services of current Medicare Advantage provider networks that really begged the question, how much is the Medicare plan able to ensure that MA networks are indeed adequate? Similarly, online provider hospital supplier network directories are not always updated. Within the last few months, CMS released some results of a provider directory accuracy pilot and found very high rates of inaccuracy in plans uh, provider listings. And, and by some estimates, there was a 46% chance that an individual going online to try to find information about their provider would be faced with inaccurate information. In addition to that, network providers generally have the right to, to join or leave a network at any time during the calendar year. And Medicare Advantage plans can also terminate providers at any time, whereas most Medicare beneficiaries are locked into their plans for a calendar year. Several years ago, for example, in Connecticut, United Health terminated, by some estimates, 1,200 physicians, and by other estimates, many more, uh, from their Medicare Advantage network, which caused, as we saw firsthand, considerable uh, a disruption in services for many of those folks who are in that plan and we're seeing providers whose contracts were terminated. In response, CMS did establish a limited special enrollment period right for network terminations, but it requires there to be a, quote, significant change in a plan's provider network 
and what significant means remains undefined. So in other words, uh, it, you might not necessarily have a special enrollment period right if your doctor is terminated, but uh, only if some undetermined other amount of other providers are also terminated might you have access to this special enrollment period right. Here, I'd like to pause really quickly and remind folks that certain individuals have an ongoing special enrollment period right to get out, in and out of, and switch Medicare Advantage plans. People are dually eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, those who have Medicare savings programs, and those with the Part D low-income subsidy. A few other considerations to walk through. Um, HMOs usually have no out-of-network coverage. There's uh, contracted networks within a specific service area, and enrollees are required to see only those contracted providers, except for urgent or emergent situations outside of the service area. There are also provisions to allow for some provision of dialysis care uh, outside of the service area. PPOs usually have out-of-network coverage available, but it's usually at a higher cost, higher cost sharing for the beneficiaries. In other words, they have a contracted network of providers uh, whom enrollees can see for lower cost sharing and non-network providers whom they can see for higher cost sharing. Medicare Advantage plans have discretion to charge cost sharing above traditional Medicare. Um, in general, Medicare Advantage plans usually charge lower co-pays or cost sharing for physician visits and sometimes specialist visits, but in some instances they can charge more than traditional Medicare, for example, uh, for durable medical equipment. There are certain services that Medicare Advantage plans by law cannot charge more than traditional Medicare. That's chemotherapy, renal dialysis, and skilled nursing facility services. However, a quick note relating to the skilled nursing facility services, we all know that in traditional Medicare, uh, beneficiaries are not required to pay cost sharing for the first 20 days in the skilled nursing facility. Medicare Advantage plans can charge cost sharing for the first 20 days in a skilled nursing facility even with this prohibition. Uh, in addition, we talked about the maximum out-of-pocket limit, a, a significant selling point for Medicare Advantage plans as opposed to traditional Medicare with no other type of supplement. But these MOOCs only apply to Part A and B services, not to Part D services or any services that the plan provides that are in addition to what traditional Medicare covers. Medicare Advantage plans have to offer benefits that are at least equal to traditional Medicare and cover everything that traditional Medicare covers. The general rule is that applies to Part A and B services, and if the plan offers Part D services, it applies to prescription drugs as well. Medicare Advantage plans can waive certain restrictions on coverage. For example, we know that uh, unlike traditional Medicare, which in order to cover a skilled nursing facility stay requires a three-day prior inpatient hospital stay, 95% of Medicare Advantage plans waive this requirement, uh, which in theory means that the whole issue of hospital observation status shouldn't be one that is seen in most Medicare Advantage plans. We also discussed that plan benefits and cost sharing can change every year, which really necessitates people taking a look at how their coverage might change from one year to the next, and to realize that just because your coverage suits you this year is no guarantee that your coverage will suit you next year. Benefits can change, cost sharing can change, providers can change, and being in an MA plan then requires vigilance on the part of enrollees. Every year, plan sponsors decide if they will continue and how or whether they will change their contracted benefits. Despite this need, though, despite the fact that Many people are in suboptimal choices, meaning they're not in plans that will provide them the, the broadest coverage for the least amount of money. Uh, most people don't change. There is a tremendous amount of inertia when it comes to enrollment in Medicare Advantage plans. And according to a recent Kaiser uh, found Family Foundation study, roughly only about one in 10 Medicare Advantage plans voluntarily switch plans on an annual basis. Uh, also, Medicare Advantage plans uh, can exclude people with end-stage renal disease with uh, kidney failure from joining the plan. This is the one group of folks in Medicare that can be legally discriminated against as far as enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan. 
There are some minor exceptions to that rule. For example, if someone is in a plan offered by the same plan sponsor before they become eligible for Medicare, they can sometimes uh, enroll in that sponsor's Medicare Advantage plan, or if that individual develops ESRD while in a Medicare Advantage plan. And finally, um, a quick note on ESRD, many restrictions, there are many restrictions that apply, as we discussed earlier, to uh, folks under 65 when it comes to Medigap rights. Individuals with uh, ESRD under 65 uh, experience even more barriers to purchasing Medigaps. Some states, even those though that allow people under 65 to purchase Medigap policy or, or provide them the right to do so, specifically exclude people with end-stage renal disease, California being a significant example. Finally, uh, Medicare Advantage plans do not provide hospital services, nor do they provide services related to those who are in clinical trials. That is not to say that people who are in Medicare Advantage cannot access hospice services or cannot access clinical trials. If they do, it just changes the way that those services are paid for and impacts how people access other services within their Medicare Advantage plan that are unrelated to hospice or unrelated to clinical trials. So in summary, choosing to access Medicare, whether through traditional Medicare or a Medicare Advantage plan, is really a personal choice. There's no definitive right or wrong answer for an individual, but requires that one uh, really consider several factors. Their overall life circumstances, whether or not they have other coverage, how much uh, they are able to afford, their health, how often will they need to go to providers, do they want to go to certain providers, their desire for flexibility or autonomy or their tolerance for uh, direction of plan through primary care physicians, gatekeepers, et cetera. Also, what is their budget? Uh, does an individual qualify for any of the assistance that might be available for cost sharing or premiums? And really tolerance for financial risk. Uh, many folks under 65, as, as Kathy mentioned, uh, a high percentage of them have, in traditional Medicare, have no other supplemental coverage, which means that they have no out-of-pocket costs for services in traditional Medicare. Is that something that someone can live with? Would such a person be better off in a Medicare Advantage plan with an out-of-pocket cap given all their other considerations? With that, uh, and after walking through um, kind of a, a, what we hope will be a useful roadmap of questions and issues to consider, when choosing whether or not to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, along with some additional considerations related to Medicare Advantage and traditional Medicare, uh, 